to Crossroads United Methodist Church. My name is Julie Shindell and I am the pastor here. And whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are joining us on Facebook Live or watching a little bit later, we are glad that you are worshiping with us and it is so good to have you here this morning. A couple of announcements to let you know things that are going on. We still have our ladies Bible study happening by Zoom tonight at six o'clock. And uh, Debbie Carney is in charge of that. If you have questions about it, she can get you some more information. Um, this upcoming Wednesday, October 28th, is our next Give, Grab, and Go dinner. And if you would like to make a reservation, please do so by tomorrow at noon. And let us know how many you would like. Um, also on Wednesday, the youth group is challenging you to a pumpkin carving contest. So this is your chance to bring a pumpkin, to uh, bring your own carving or paints or whatever you want to do, and join the youth for uh, uh, some good times, some fun, a chance to get to know each other a little bit better. If you want to grab your dinner, you can eat it up at the portico on the picnic tables and then carve your pumpkin after that. We will have prizes, um, so we hope you come and join us um, and carve a pumpkin. Who knows, who knows who the best will be, but I saw the youth last year and they are pretty creative, so you better bring your game. It is good once again to be together today and to turn our hearts and our thoughts to God as we worship. So let us open with a word of prayer. Come among us, living Lord. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our hearts and minds so that we may recognize your presence, hear your voice, know your will, and walk in your way. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able at this time as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed and sharing what we believe as Christians and United Methodists. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as our praise band leads us in our first song, I Am a Friend of God. Thank you. 
try and speak louder. Green is color nature. Blue calms us. Purple is used for royalty. Yellow is cheerful. Pink is soft. Red is exciting. And orange is fun. They have different meanings, but when they're put together, like in a stained glass window, each color is no more important than the other one. You also notice in the stained glass the different shapes. Each shape is no more important than the other one, but they all come together to form a beautiful work of art. Christianity is the same way. Each of us have different gifts. Some of us could be encouragers, some teachers, some pastors, some know how to be cheerful, some take care of others, the list goes on. We have many different gifts. And by recognizing the gifts that God has given us, we see God's work in our lives. When we all come together as a church and use our gifts together, no gift is more important than the other one. But we all come together and make a beautiful piece of art, just like a stained glass window. We know, we show the world that God's work, God is working through us by all coming together and putting our special gifts together. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to recognize our gifts, our special gifts, and know that they are no more important than each other's. Help us to recognize your work in our lives and remember that we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, Jennifer is coming to read the scripture, and I invite you to stand as you are able in honor of the reading. <laughs> I'll project. Good morning. 
Lord. Today's scripture is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 3. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. Today we're beginning a new series called Prayers, Politics, and Peace. Don't start sweating, it's going to be fine. <laughs> But with record, with early voting at a, a record high and only nine days until the official election, we all have felt it. Tensions are running high um, as to what the future holds for our country. So how do we as people of faith manage the political strife that has been plaguing our media and has been trickling into our relationships? Before you run for the door, it's not the church's job to tell you who to vote for so you can breathe. I know most of you have probably already made up your mind if you haven't already voted. But I do know that we can take a look at what scripture says when it comes to making big decisions. When we are making any big decision in life, how do we use discernment? Romans tells us to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I know when it comes to voting, it seems there are no options that are good and acceptable and perfect. Yet we are encouraged to exercise our right to vote, thanks to many who have worked so hard to fight for this right for us. And I believe it is crucial that we make prayerfully informed decisions about how we will actively live out our faith in the midst of this election and beyond. So what exactly is discernment? How do you prayerfully and faithfully make an important decision? The very first book we were assigned for our doctorate ministry program was Henry Nowen's book called Discernment. And quite simply, he describes discernment as the spiritual practice that accesses and seeks to understand what God is saying. How do we understand what God is saying? How do we use the Holy Spirit to teach us what God wants? A lot of times I've been asked how I have discerned major life decisions, whether it was going through ordination or deciding to foster a child or even going back to school most recently. And the way it's asked so earnestly of me, uh, it makes me realize that people want a really solid answer. And one time I responded, you mean you want like a three-step process of, of how to discern God's will? And they looked at me like, yeah, that'd be great. Tell us. Unfortunately, it's not always an easy three-step process, uh, but my discernment for the call to ministry is one that took over 10 years, and to be honest, I continue to wrestle with just how I'm living it out to this day. But I thought about certain steps that I make when I am discerning, and I noticed a few patterns that seem to come up, and I think this is applicable for any of us in any major life decision. First, I educate myself. I want to make an informed decision so I gather as much information as possible. When I was pursuing ordained ministry, I talked to several of my mentors. I talked to those who were ordained. I talked to those who chose not to get ordained. I asked about the process. I asked what they gained from their ordination or where they were restricted if they had not been ordained. And I looked at as many different viewpoints as I could find so that I could make my own decision somewhere in the middle. Hear that, that it's not just about going around looking to have people agree with you or encourage what they think you want. You have to look at both sides. You look at the benefits and the difficulties. 
you look at the pros and the cons. I looked at all of my options and made sure I knew about each one. With an upcoming election, the media does its best to sway us one way or another based on the character flaws of each candidate. But if we can get past the name calling and the avoidance of direct questions, we can look at where each candidate stands on important issues. I encourage you to do your research, inform yourself on what the issues are, where you stand, and where each candidate stands. Use that knowledge to inform your decision. Scripture tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't give in to the way the world plays each side against each other. Don't be fooled by the media as they attempt to show you the most outrageous characteristics of each candidate. Instead, use your mind. Use the power of knowledge to allow the Holy Spirit to transform you in your decision. So often we hear that as Christians, we cannot vote for candidate A or candidate B because of what they stand for. Or we must vote for so-and-so because their beliefs align with the biblical teaching. John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, gave us a very powerful and balanced method of discernment when it comes to Scripture. He believed in the primacy of Scripture. He felt it was essential to understand and use in decision making and living our everyday lives. And yet the way he interpreted scripture was viewed through three lenses of tradition, experience, and reason. Who's heard this before? Lifelong Methodist. Some of us have been taught this before. You may have heard it called the Wesley Quadrilateral. Uh, each of the four elements have an equal side. But through my study, I believe a more accurate image would be a three-legged stool where scripture rests on top. Tradition, experience, and reason are the legs, all supporting scripture. Scripture is the most important, and Wesley believed that reading and interpreting scripture was a means of grace. It was a way to experience the love and forgiveness of God. It was a way to connect in a deeper and more powerful way. Well, believe it or not, scripture can be a little tricky to interpret it at times. And depending on how you read it, it can be interpreted many different ways. We could easily pick and choose different verses that support our cause. But if we read them out of context, sometimes the meaning changes. So that's why Wesley thought it was so important to read scripture through the lens of tradition, experience reason. Tradition. What have we learned from the history of the church that helps us to understand scripture? Many of our traditions have been passed down over time, and that includes the interpretation of scripture. Example, examples that we use today include the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. These are uh, traditional words that have been passed down from Christian leaders as the formative aspects of our faith and as, as creeds that have stood the test of time. Experience is another lens through which we interpret scripture and it allows us to look at the world we live in and live through to gain meaning from the scriptures. But we also use scripture to gain meaning of the experiences that we face. When we are in times of lament, we look to the Psalms to see prayers of people crying out to God in agony. We recognize that we are not the first to experience feeling distant from God. And we can use scripture to offer us comfort and direction. Reason is the final lens through which we interpret scripture, and with our constantly changing culture, we need to make sure that what we're reading makes reasonable sense in terms of today's uh, terminology and context. The meaning of scripture does not change over time, but it is a living word 
whose interpretation is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and how we understand it may be shaped by our surroundings. For the longest time, when I heard the story of the prodigal son, we know the prodigal son, the son that takes his inheritance, leaves, uh, squanders it all, comes back, and is forgiven by his father. For the longest time when I heard this story, I thought prodigal meant someone that went and came back, someone that returned. What does prodigal mean? It means wasteful. It means lavish. It's a totally different context in the story. It's not a word that we hear often outside of this scripture text. There's all kinds of biblical terms that we hear, such as talents, prodigal, uh, the widow's might. A threshing floor that reveal more to modern audiences if we interpret them with today's context in mind. These words may not make much sense to us now, and so we have to look at what they represented during their time and how they mean something new to us today. When it comes to discerning who to vote for, how do the issues stand up against our interpretation of scripture? What do we understand about feeding the hungry, about caring for the widow and orphan, about loving our neighbor, about how to treat immigrants, and about praying for our enemies? How does our interpretation of scripture through tradition, reason, and experience Help us understand the political issues that each party stands for. When I'm in a mode of discernment, one of the first things I do is pray. If I don't keep God as a part of the conversation, I will be much more likely to choose based on what I want as opposed to what I feel God wants. That's just our natural instinct, right? We know what we want. We want God to affirm that in us. But I hope that we pray as we are doing our research. I hope that we pray as we are interpreting scripture. And I hope that you are praying for our country and for each candidate. Because yes, Jesus even told us to pray for our enemies. I hope that you are praying for your part in this decision. And prayer is a way of asking the Holy Spirit to guide our decisions so that we can find peace and understanding. Philippians 4 verses 5 through 7 tells us, Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Consider this the final step if we're, if we're counting. Seek a decision that brings you peace. Look for a decision that you can live with and take comfort in. And that's not always easy. Sometimes it feels like we're stuck and we can't move forward or make a decision. Perhaps that means that we haven't yet reached the best decision. Or perhaps we, haven't, we aren't really ready to make a decision. There, there's a little bit of a difference with the election because there's an upcoming deadline to decide. But hopefully, when you pass that ballot, it is one that brings you peace. Remember Paul's words in Romans, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God has given us good wisdom according to our faith. So don't think boastfully, but think in relation to our understanding of the cross and of how we interpret scripture through tradition, reason and experience. When the Holy Spirit truly is invited into our decision making, 
And when we prayerfully listen to what God wants, then we will find decisions that lead us to peace. And peace is what I wish for each of you. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we celebrate with David Miller that he is joined by his sister, Grace Ann Miller, as they give a special song and sing my prayer.
celebrate our peacemakers. They have been very, very busy. They, they are often working on several projects throughout the year. Um, and I believe they've had a little extra time to not only be making masks, but if you can see these beautiful, uh, what's spread across our altar here, our pillowcases. Um, they have been working on pillowcases um, for a company, a group called A Case for Smiles. Um, this came out from a mother who made a special pillowcase for her child when he had a terminal illness and was hospitalized for long periods of time. And having a pillowcase that wasn't the standard hospital white um, brought so much joy. And he wanted one for his roommate, and then they wanted one for all the children who were on their floor. And this is how um, this program began. So our peacemakers have been working very hard to use fun and colorful fabrics that appeal to children um, so that when they are sick, when they are in the hospital for long times, they can pick out something that is meaningful to them. Um, and it gives them a little bit of hope on the days when they have to have especially difficult procedures. Uh, they have worked to make, they are still working on a couple at home, but together I think there will be a total of close to 100 pillowcases. And we celebrate that they will be going to uh, make 100 children smile a little bit more um, during some of their most difficult days. So at this time I wanted to offer a blessing and give thanks to God um, for the hard work and for the children they will go to. Let us pray. Loving and most gracious God, we truly and humbly give you thanks. We thank you for the family that inspired A Case for Smiles. We thank you for the love and the dedication and the hard work that was put into sewing each and every pillowcase, picking out each fabric with care, and knowing uh, that it would go to a child in need. We pray for those who would receive these pillowcases that it will bring a smile to their faces, that it will offer them a tiny bit of comfort and hope and joy. We pray for all of those who are going through difficult procedures that are dealing with terminal illnesses and long-term battles with cancer. Lord, we ask that you will surround them with your love and let these pillowcases be a reminder that they are truly loved and surrounded by your presence. We give all the thanks and glory to you. In your holy and precious name we pray. We do want to give thanks and pray for those that are on our prayer list at this time. And um, these are who we are aware of uh, today. We pray for Her Nation's dad as he continues to struggle um, with health issues. We pray for Neil Hester. Um, Neil is home from the hospital, but he's actually begun receiving hospice care. Um, the, the doctors and nurses felt that this was the best way he could get the care that he needs. It's a higher level of care than home health care. So they are hoping this will help him to begin to make some improvements to have uh, hospice care there more often um, than other health care was able to be there. So we pray for him for, for healing. We pray for Laura Jean as she cares for him. We continue to pray with Morgan Poole Walker and celebrate as she has she already moved to rehab or not she is she is in rehab now um, so we celebrate that she is making incredible strides. We pray um, for we pray with Alexis Nation for um, her fiance Corey Overstreet's grandmother Pam Matthews um, who has been diagnosed with colon cancer. We pray with Marty and Stephanie Boyd who are asking for continued prayers for Jess Dollar, who's undergoing cancer treatments. Uh, we pray for Jennifer Edwards' cousin, Waver Griffiths, who fell and broke her left foot in three places. Uh, we continue to pray for those with COVID. We pray for our healthcare workers and first responders who continue uh, to save lives each and every day. We pray with Brenda Edwards for uh, her friends, Kay and Dwight Hodges, who are recovering from COVID and pneumonia. We pray with Doug and Susan Smith for Nancy Sermons, a former admin here at Crossroads, um, who's recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. We pray for Nate Bramble and his family on the death of his other grandmother, Judy Bramble, who's in Wisconsin. Uh, we continue to pray for Paul Wine, Larry Reed, and Jenny Jones and their healing. 
Uh, we pray with Kaylee Van Belkom for Ann Jones, who is uh, Kaylee's grandmother, um, fighting colon cancer. We pray with Kim Gillespie for Mike Bass, her cousin, and ask for safe travels. And we pray with Cindy, uh, with Cindy Thomas for Cindy Buckner, who has pain from pancre pancreatic cancer. It is good to know that God hears our prayers, whether they are said aloud or whether they remain on our hearts. So let us turn our thoughts and hearts to God as we pray at this time. Loving and most gracious God, we come to you this morning. We come and we lift our voices, but Lord, we also know that there is power in the silence. When there are moments when we don't quite know what or how to pray. When there are times where we are not quite sure how to make decisions. We turn to you. We ask that as we breathe in and out, that we will be breathing in your Holy Spirit. That we will feel your presence among us and within us. That we will be reassured of your presence and your love. And that we will allow you to lead and guide us in everything that we do. Lord, we ask for healing for so many and ask that you intervene where possible. We give thanks for the remarkable strides that many are making as they are continuing to face battle after battle. But Lord, we know that there are many ahead who are still undergoing treatment, who are dealing with diagnoses, who are just trying to make it day to day. We call their names out to you. We lift them up for you to hear. And yet we know that you already know. We know that you are already with them. We know that you are already caring in a way that only you can. But as we lift our voices and as we pray, Lord, help us to feel connected. Help us to know your power. Help us to know your discernment that gives us peace. We pray for the chance to be better today than we were yesterday. And the chance to be better tomorrow than we are today. And we ask that you will guide us in that way. As we pray to you, Lord, give us a sense of peace. Give us a sense of understanding. And help us to know what it means, not only to be your follower, but to be your child. To be someone in your family as close as we can imagine. To be your disciple, to be your apostle, to be the one whom you call beloved. Lord, you are so good as you teach us how to pray when we don't have our own words. And we pray to you now at this time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our last song is uh, Be Thou My Vision, and we celebrate the chance to let the praise band lead us once again.
again, when the service is over, if you'll just remain in your seats until an usher comes to direct you out one of our three exits. Uh, we do give thanks to each and every one of you who are continuing to um, turn in your estimate of giving cards, your pledge cards for 2021. If you've not had a chance to do that, we encourage you to prayerfully discern if that is something you are able to do. Um, we do have offering plates at each of the exits, and I invite you to leave your offering and or your pledge cards as you leave today. And we truly give you thanks for continuing to give and support the mission and ministry of Crossroads here and beyond. As we open this place, I know it's a difficult season for many reasons, uh, but in the coming days, things may get especially tense. And so I invite you to use that power of discernment. Speak to God and try to understand what God is saying in your life. Use the reason, tradition, and experience to understand scripture. Do your research and pray, pray, pray until you find a decision that gives you peace. This is my prayer for each of you as you go from this place and know that God is with you always and God loves you too. Go in peace.